Greetings, chess players, and welcome to another exciting episode of Analyze That, the chess show where you get to be the star. In order to participate, all you have to do is join the Daily Chess Musings Club on chess.com and then email a chess game that you would like us to look at to analyze that at gmail.com. I will look at your game, and if I think that it will be of interest to our audience, I will include it in one of our episodes of Analyze That. Today's Analyze That is a special episode because all the games chosen are from the Halloween Blitz Chess Extravaganza that took place on October 31st, 2020. Our first game was played between Jollification and Royal Knight 101. Let's take a look and see what happens. Jollification begins with pawn to e4, putting a pawn in the center. And Royal Knight 101 plays c6, the Karakon defense. To learn more about this opening, I suggest watching episode 3 of my Master Chess Theater series, which is entitled A Magnus Opus. White plays two pawn to c4, and this is now referred to as the Accelerated Panov Attack, and is a fairly rare choice, but has been gaining in popularity, especially at the highest levels. The Panov Attack move of pawn to c4 traditionally is played following 1e4, c6, 2d4, d5, 3 exd5, cxd5, and then pawn to c4, and it generates good attacking chances for white, but at the expense of creating an isolated queen's pawn. Playing c4 on move 2 allows for the possibility of transposition into the pan of attack, especially after 4 pawn to d4, but also presents many unique possibilities. Hopefully we'll see some of those. Royal Knight 101 plays 2d5, 3cxd5, an interesting alternative, of course, would be after 2d5, playing 3exd5, cxd5, cxd5, knight f6, and then queen to a4. I have played this line myself and enjoy the unique positions that it creates. But back to our main game. So after 3 cxd5, black played cxd5, and white played queen to b3. As far as I can tell, this is already new territory in the Karakhan, which is just more proof that chess is far from being played out. dxe4, and then 5 bishop to c4. And now we see what white had in mind with queen to b3. But 5e6 easily stops white's early threat on the belly button. 6, knight c3. White is down a pawn, but likely has enough extra pieces to develop to compensate. 6, knight f6. Black must and does start developing pieces of his own. 7d3. Creating a path for the bishop on c1, as well as threatening to play dx e4, which would give white a center pawn. 7 ex d3. 8 bishop e3. As expected, white develops their second bishop and now has the possibility of castling queenside. Knight c6. 9, castle, queenside. Um, honestly, I might prefer playing knight f3, because if you play knight f3, you develop another piece and leave a question as to which side you will castle on. 
but white played nine castle queenside and black plays nine bishop e7 a very caracon style conservative move which prepares black's king to castle 10 rook takes d3 regaining a pawn with a threat 10 queen c7 rather than block the threat with bishop d7 black chooses to place their queen on an open file with white's king 11 knight to b5 white sees what black did there and is not afraid of complications 11 queen to b8 safely moving the queen away from the knight's threat and 12 knight f3 white now has six pieces developed against black's three 12 a6 but black seizes the initiative by threatening the exposed knight knight b to d4 and then knight takes d4 there are a lot of possibilities in such messy and imbalanced positions for example after 13 knight b to d4 black could have played perhaps 13 knight to b4 and then the rook would obviously need to go somewhere so maybe rook d2 and then perhaps b5 now the bishop's got to go somewhere so you you see black um, continuing with that initiative bishop goes to e2 and black plays e5 now attacking the knight so that line also maintains the initiative for black but black played 13 nx d4 and white responded with bishop takes d4 and of course white had many continuation choices as well for example instead of playing 14 bishop takes d4 what about 14 rook takes d4 well i suppose black could still play pawn to b5 but rather than retreat the bishop right away maybe bishop to f4 threatening the queen queen could go to b6 and then white could move their bishop to safety bishop d3 but then black could play bishop c5 attacking the rook twice and white could respond with a surprising bishop to e5 move in which case after bishop takes d4 bishop takes d4 and it's rather spicy and we do momentarily have the initiative but my instincts tell me that uh, this kind of spicy chess might actually leave white with a little bit of indigestion so let's try something else instead of 14 bishop takes d4 white could also try 14 knight takes d4 and then we see again b5 and then uh, here we could try this knight takes b5 idea reminiscent of the uh, opera house game the morphe opera house game knight takes b5 ax b5 bishop takes b5 check bishop d7 and then uh, bishop takes d7 check and knight takes d7 and looks like we run out of steam a little bit um i don't see a, a good continuation in in this line so as it turns out i think white's 14 bishop takes d4 was probably the best move and black plays 14 b5 which is a strong move that traps white's bishop 15 rook h to d1 an interesting alternative for rook h d1 might actually be a knight e5 the reason is after uh, bx c4 queen x c4 um, bishop b7 you've got queen a4 check and with the knight already threatening d7 and uh, the rook on the d file is probably you know black's gonna have to move their king king f8 um, 
and black is ahead in material, but definitely has some developmental issues. So that that would be perhaps I I think that's what I would have done there. Let's go back to the actual game with 15 rook h to d1 and 15 bx c4. And white did not want to trade queens here. I don't blame them. 15, uh, 16 qx c4. Black castles. And now black has winning material advantage and a safe king. White plays bishop e5, threatening black's queen again. Black tries again to trade queens, as it definitely would favor them. And white again declines the trade, which is wise. But knight d5, check this out. It's a nice discovered attack on uh, white's queen, plus it's moving the knight closer to white's king. And white responds with 19, queen to g3. Hoping black doesn't see that q takes g7 would be a checkmate. Bishop f6, but black does, and now has a mate threat of his own. Down here on b2. Rook takes d5. Move 20, rook takes d5. Rather than continuing to play along with black's plan of uh, bishop takes f6, white tries to create some confusion queen to c4 check and apparently it works because black missed the best continuation do you see what a better continuation was um for move 20 what about queen c6 check king to b1 then ex d5 bishop takes f6 and the queen can take f6 but instead, black played 20, queen c4, which means that their queen isn't on the sixth rank to be able to capture back. White steps out of check with king b1. Black plays ex d5, of course. Bishop takes f6. And now the bishop takes f6 not only re regains the material, but is also threatening mate. Queen goes to e4 check with the idea of moving the queen to g6 to stop the mate. King a1, stepping out of check. Queen goes to g6 as expected. And queen takes g6. Instead of 24 qx g6, I think I would prefer 24 bishop c3. And then after uh, queen takes g3, fx g3, bishop goes to g4, rook goes to d3, bishop takes f3, and pawn takes um, f3, which is still winning for black, but certainly not simple to convert. Certainly not a, a, a simple process. Um, black would have to prove that they can uh, play play a quality endgame. Let's go back to our game. So after 24 queen takes g6, 24 hx g6, 25 bishop e7 threatening the rook, uh, followed by rook e8 threatening the bishop. And then rook takes d5. And I guess white's hallucinating a little bit by seeing a mirage of a back rank mate. Um, but if the rook takes the bishop, there is no there is no back rank mate because black already has a escape square presented, but perhaps they're also um, seeing a possibility of a hook mate, um, which we just did an episode of on checking time. So it could be that was on their, on their mind. If you haven't seen our series checking time, we look at uh, um, beautiful, checkmating uh, patterns that are noteworthy enough to have their own names. And I just recently did an episode on the hook mate, but uh, after rook takes, rook says check, king goes out here, you've got knight g5, and that still doesn't, uh, you still can't uh, slide the rook 
behind and, and deliver a, ho a hook mate there either. So um, this just doesn't work. And black sees that, plays 26, rook takes e7. Rook d8, check as expected, king h7. Knight g5, king h6 as expected. Um, 29, king b1, bishop f5, check. King to c1, rook takes d8. Things are getting a little ugly now. b3, rook c7, check. King b2 shouldn't be long now. Rook to d2, check. King a3, rook c to c2, stacking the rooks on the seventh. Knight takes f7, check. Might as well throw in a check, because you can. King h7. And uh, white, I'm yeah, white, white resigns here. Um, this was a very nice game by both players and included an interesting opening idea. Um, like I said, we got into new territory in the in the Karakhan, accelerated Panov uh, quite easily, and there's nothing wrong with the line chosen. So it's it's an interesting line. It's a noteworthy line, and um, an instructive demonstration of the power of the initiative by Black. Um, white had like six pieces developed against black's three, but black, um, was able to play pawn a six and start pushing white's pieces backwards, um, and, and really took control of the game. Um, and also, and also, uh, uh, some good, uh, end game technique by, uh, by Royal Knight 101. So very good game, Jollification and Royal Knight 101. Um, and thanks again for playing in the uh, Halloween Blitz extravaganza. Let's move on to our second game of the evening. Our second game also features Jollification. And this time Jollification is playing Sparky Chess Tiger 2012. And this one came from the third Blitz tournament. The first game we looked at tonight came from the first um, of the trio of Halloween Blitz Chess Extravaganza tournaments. And this one comes from tournament number three. All these tournaments are viewable on, uh, if you go to uh, Daily Chess Musings Club on chess.com and click the live tournament link. You can uh, look through the all the games from these, uh, from these fun tournaments. Plus, um, be sure to check out the live stream I did. I should have mentioned that earlier. I uh, live streamed the entire Halloween Blitz extravaganza. Um, and that video is uh, fairly entertaining and well liked on our uh, YouTube channel as well. All right. So to our game, Jollification starts with E4. And Sparky Chess Tiger 2012 plays E5. Bishop C4, Knight F6. And 3d4, the Urasov Gambit. That's a fun way for white to steer the game into a tactical fist fight. I play this um, fairly often myself. Um, fun stuff. 3ex d4. The other capture at black's disposal, obviously, is knight takes e4. But then after uh, dx e5, um, Black's Knight is especially vulnerable considering White has QD5 and QF3 also threatening mate on F7. So they have to be very accurate. Um, for instance, um, a game that comes to mind that I played recently was uh, um, Black played Bishop C5 here. And then... I played queen to d5. I just ignored their threat on my belly button. When they played bishop takes f2 check, I played king f1. Then my opponent played qh4. And now it's my turn to attack the belly button. q takes f7 check. King goes to d8. q takes g7. Rook needs to move to safety. Rook went to e8 in that game. Knight f3, developing with the threat against the queen. Queen goes to e7. Um, I traded queens. Queen takes, rook takes. And then I played bishop d5, attacking the knight, that which is defending the bishop. 
Bishop goes to b6, and then I played bishop takes e4. Knight went to c6, and then I played bishop g5, um, pinning the rook to the king. Black played d6, ex d6, cx d6, of course. Then I developed another piece, knight c3. See how quickly we get developed in the Eurosoft Gambit. Um, black played bishop g4, and then uh, knight d5. Threatening the rook, that which is pinned. Black played king d7, stepping out of the pin and preparing a path to bring the other rook into the action. Um, I played 17, bishop takes e7, and then uh, knight takes e7. And here, knight f6, check, nice fork. And uh, king went to e6, stepping out of that, knight takes g4, thank you. Rook goes to f8, and then I played rook to e1, setting up a discovered check on black's king. Black played h5, threatening my knight, but bishop takes b7 was check, king d7. And then uh, knight went to f2, which unpins the knight on f3. Black played knight g6, g3. Knight e5, and then I played knight takes e5, dx e5, and then uh, rook e2. And I went on to win easily uh, during, th this was actually played during a simul in 2005, but enough fun looking at this uh, uh, simul game. Let's look at another possibility for black after... Uh, 3 nx e4. So again, um, after uh, 3 nx e4, white plays dx e5, leaving this knight very exposed to the uh, threats of queen d5, queen f3, forking it with a, a threat of mate. And uh, black, I've seen black also try uh, knight c6. That's played against me fairly often. And uh, here I just, you know, there, there's other lines you could play, obviously. Um, but I like to just do bishop takes f7, king takes f7. And then uh, queen d5, check, forking the king and knight. King goes back to e8. And then uh, we get the knight. So we get our piece back. And uh, black cannot castle now. So we, we have a, uh, a nice easy advantage. Easy way to obtain an advantage is white. Um, but enough fun with uh, looking at 3 nx e4. Let's return to our actual game. So after 3 ex d4, white played for knight f3, and then knight c6. White played 5 castle. And now we are in... Uh, and now you should recognize this because we are in the classical variation of the two knights defense. And that should be very familiar territory for uh, at least uh, my students. Five bishop e7. So for those of you keeping track at home, haha, this is now we're the um, classical variation of the two knights defense, but this is called the de river. Um, defense named in memory of the Paul Morphy contemporary Jules Zamor de River, um, who liked to play bishop e7 in these uh, Italian structures a lot. Um, but it's also worth knowing that black could have also played the more popular, rather than the de River defense, black could have played knight takes e4, Rook e1, d5, of course, defending the knight, threatening the bishop. Um, bishop takes d5, queen takes d5, and then this nice knight c3 move should be, um, again, familiar to a uh, familiar theme to a lot of my students. And then uh, black can play queen a5. Um, and that's that's the main line, but uh, black chose to play the de river defense, and that's fine. Let's see what white does. Um, white plays e5. So 6e5. And that's an excellent move. 
of course the other uh, the other main line would be rook e1 pawn to d6 and then knight takes d4 and then castle for black and then knight c3 is white and that's also fine um, just just showing you a little bit of the uh, variations that are common in these uh, Italian structures. Um, two knights defense Italian structures. So six e5 was played, gaining space, attacking the knight. And black responds with six knight e4, rook e1, knight c5, knight takes d4, Knight takes d4, and uh, up until this point, Jollification and the Sparky Chess Tiger 2012 were replicating a 2020 speed chess battle I recently watched between Alexander Kostanik and uh, Dronavili Harika. Um, both are grandmasters, and uh, th their game continued just for. Just for our knowledge purpose, let me back up one move to eight knight takes d4. Again, the uh, Costa Nicarica game continued with uh, castling, eight castle. And then uh, Costa Nic played knight f5 and knight e6, knight c3 developing another piece, pawn to d6. Knight takes e7, queen takes e7, ex d6, cx d6, knight d5 um, threatening the queen, queen went back to d8, c3, knight to e5 is what Harika played there, and then uh, threatening the bishop, bishop backs up to b3, and then knight c5 threatening the bishop again, bishop backs up to c2. Bishop e6, bishop f4, knight g6, 18, bishop to g3, um, a5. So black black gets a little bit of initiative here, but then uh, with uh, pawn a5 isn't, uh, isn't threatening anything immediately. Um, 1993. Rook a6, interesting move by Harika. You see why she played a5, so she could get the rook up to a6. Um, knight f5. Bishop takes f5. Harika did not want that knight hanging around her king. Bishop takes f5. Then a4. Queen went to d4. Costanique played 22, queen d4. Um, queen to b6, rook a to b1, putting the rook in the same file as the opponent's queen. Queen b5, bishop takes d6, knight to e6, bishop takes e6, and then uh, rook d8, pinning the bishop to the queen, bishop c4, um, skewering the queen to the rook. Queen goes to d7, and then bishop a6. And with that little tactical flurry, uh, Harika resigned. But it's really cool for me to get to compare um, Jollification and Sparky Chess Tiger, two young players in the Daily Chess Musings Club, to two elite players like Alexander Kostanik and Dronavili Harika. Um, but now let's get back to our actual game between Jollification and Sparky Chess Tiger 2012. So Black has just played 8NXD4. White plays 9QXD4. Castle 10 Knight to C3. Knight E6. And I would prefer to play as white, but thus far both players have really played excellent chess. White plays 11, bishop x is e6. Having said that, I'm not a fan of bishop takes e6 here. White's light squared bishop was a beautiful piece and just traded itself for an awkwardly placed knight. I would really like to have seen 
white continue with, let's see, so we go back one move. Um, white could have played Q G4. Um, obviously setting up some threats involving putting the queen in the same file as your opponent's king. And black could play D6, EX D6. Queen takes D6 maybe as black. And then uh, bishop E3 with uh, rook A to D1 soon. And uh, white would have a lot of really nicely placed pieces. White's pieces would definitely be in better locations than black's. So I would, I would prefer that kind of uh, situation over just trading my um, light bishop for black's awkwardly placed knight on e6. But having said that, white played bishop takes e6, black played dx e6, 12 queen e3, b6, and very quickly now, black is solving all of his developmental problems. White plays queen g3, setting up some of those threats uh, I talked about, um, including bishop h6 immediately, right guys? And black plays bishop h4. That's this, this kind of um, way of dealing with the coming threat um, from white seems a little strange to me. A less complicated way of doing it would simply be after white plays 13 queen g3, simply play king h8. Then there's not going to be a pin with bishop h6, right? Uh, white could play bishop f4, I guess maybe is the best spot for that bishop now. Um, not really a lot of good locations for the dark bishop. And then uh, black could play bishop b7. White could play rook a to d1. Black could play queen e8. And uh, it's, it's a very equal position with white having this better rook, but black having a better bishop, right? But black played 13 bishop h4, which seems like an uncomfortable, unusual way of stopping white from playing bishop h6. Let's see what happens, though. White plays queen to f3, um, taking that nice diagonal. And black plays bishop a6. Um, in my opinion, this is a critical strategic mistake. Black should not be allowing white to control this um, h1 to a8 diagonal with their queen. Instead, he should have dealt with white's threat by placing his rook on b8 and then his bishop on b7, thus claiming the diagonal that should be his. Um, but he didn't, so I, I think that's a, uh, I think that's a, a fairly major strategic error. Let's see what happens. Um, 15, queen to g4. White is realigning his queen for the bishop h6 attack again. And black plays rook e8. Obviously a mistake and missing white's threat. The best way to deal with white's threat of bishop h6 would simply be to play f5 because if you're attacking white's queen they cannot play bishop h6 without losing their queen and uh, on passant obviously it doesn't work because take take and now black would be the one threatening his opponent's king so returning to our actual game after 15 rook to e8, white does play bishop h6. And if white's pawn wasn't on e5, black could easily defend this by either putting a queen or a bishop on f6. But since white's pawn on e5, this is highly problematic for black. Black plays g6, of course. And then 17, rook a to d1. Not only is black's queen under attack, but it is also responsible for defending the bishop on h4. So its options are limited to queen to e7 in order to maintain the defense of the bishop. But after 18, 
g3 the bishop has nowhere to run anyways it is effectively trapped so 18 bishop takes g3 h x g3 bishop b7 black wisely returns the bishop to the a8 to h1 diagonal where it should have been to begin with white plays 20 knight e4 but this pretty much forces black to trade his beloved bishop for that knight because you can't allow that knight to hop into f6 with check and indeed 20 bishop takes e4 rook takes e4 rook a to d8 rook takes d8 and all these peace trades inches white closer to victory rook takes d8 bishop g5 queen to d7 and then uh, 24 bishop takes d8 of course the last several moves are a very good demonstration of simplifying into a winning endgame queen takes d8 25 rook d4 queen e8 26 queen d1 king g7 27 rook d7 c5 28 rook takes a7 king h6 queen d2 king g7 30 queen to d7 stacking on the seventh queen f8 rook to c7 king h6 rook to c8 queen to g7 queen to d2 check g5 blocking the check f4 adding more pressure to the pawn gx f4 uh, queen takes f4 check king goes to g6 queen g4 check king h6 queen takes g7 king takes g7 and now um as if it wasn't clear earlier white is easily winning but this is a blitz game so um play continued white played uh, 38 rook c6 king g6 rook takes b6 king f5 rook b5 king takes e5 41 rook takes c5 check king d6 rook h5 king e7 rook takes h7 king f6 a4 e5 a5 e4 a6 e3 rook goes to h2 e2 rook takes e2 king g5 a7 f5 a8 equals a queen f4 51 gx f4 check king takes f4 queen f8 check king g3 rook g2 check king h4 and queen h8 check mate on move 54. this was a very instructive game culminated in excellent end game technique um, by jollification along the way we got to discuss the Eurosoft gambit and that was fun and we got to see some uh important uh, thematic lines in the Italian two knights defense. And we also got to see the importance of controlling long diagonals. So it was definitely a worthwhile journey. Um, thank you to Jollification and Sparky Chess Tiger 2012 for taking part in the Halloween Bliss Chess Extravaganza. Now let's move to our third game of the evening. Our third game is between Chess Wizard David and BRHS2000. Thanks again, uh, Chess Wizard David, for uh, joining the uh, tournament. I haven't uh, had the pleasure of watching you play in uh, several years, and it was, it was nice to see how you've progressed. Let's take a look at the game. Chess Wizard David played e4 and BRHS 2000 played c5, uh, 2 pawn to d4, cx d4, 3 c3. So in the previous game, we saw how to have fun attacking against e5 with the Eurosoft Gambit. And in this game, apparently we're going to get to see how to create an, a fun attacking game against the Sicilian with the Smith Mora Gambit. But Brian or uh, brhs 2000 i used his his actual name um attempts to diffuse some of white's fun i often see this type of move used against the danish gambit and now we'll get to see it against the smith mora 
The idea is that by leaving White's pawn on c3, Black can slow down his development because then uh, he's not taking and White can't take with uh, uh, take back with knight takes c3. And also, now White has no path to get his bishop to uh, c4 directly. So this kind of uh, take the first pawn and then scoot forward to d3 um, is often used, as I said, to diffuse some of the uh, dynamite in the Danish gambit, but also uh, it can be used um, against Smith Moore. And chess wizard David does play bishop takes d3. Uh, black plays g6, five bishop e3, bishop g7, six, queen d2. The white bishop and queen battery um, will be handy after black uh, castles kingside because when your opponent castles behind a fianchetto bishop a very good strategy is to trade your bishop for theirs thus by creating an open space in front of their king and a very common way of doing that is by lining up the um, queen behind your bishop um, to go out in this case to h6 to set up that trade so this makes sense. Um, black plays six, knight c6, knight f3. And black plays uh, d5. Dangerous aggression. I'm not surprised that BRHS2000 played this. He, he plays these kind of tricky lines sometimes. Um, but th this is dangerous, especially so given the fact that white can castle, but black can't. So black's threatening to open up the center um, possibly on his own on his own king but note I characterize this as dangerous aggression and not quite a mistake because I don't see how to punish it directly right now eight plays exd5 queen xd5 nine castle black is fine now but needs to get castled as soon as possible 9e5. Another aggressive pawn push, but this time I do believe it is a mistake. Better would have been 9 knight f6, queen e2, and then castling. Both sides are uh, safely castled. But instead, after 9e5, white plays 10, rookie 1, and white is already planning to punish black for opening up the center on their own king by placing a rook in the e-file. Uh, 10 knight f6, bishop f4. See, taking advantage of the fact that the king's still there and black was scooting these center pawns um, forward. White has three attackers on the e5 pawn and that's the only thing standing between white's rook on e1 and black's king. 11 knight h5. This is a brilliant response in that it adds another defender to e5, um, but also is threatening white's bishop on f4. So 12 bishop takes e5. And that's okay, but not the best move. I think I prefer playing c4 against the queen as it creates with tempo square for white's knight to develop to. For example, if we go back a move, we could play c4 and then black could play, black needs to move their queen, d6. And now we've got this uh, c3 square for our knight to go to. Um, but I wouldn't go there right away necessarily i might play uh, bishop e4 here and then after queen takes um, bishop takes d2 now our bishop's no longer threatened and then black can castle but we get to play knight c3 so we've solved that that problem that black um, created when they left the pawn on c3 blocking our development um, and so I, I definitely prefer, definitely prefer this line over what was actually played in the game. But let's get back to what was played in the game. And that is uh, 12, bishop takes e5. Knight takes e5. 
13 bishop b5 check um the discover check is tempting at first but obviously fails because black's queen can just take you move the bishop out of the way and say check from a different direction but black's queen can take what is checking the queen but uh brhs 2000 did not and that should just lose a queen and in fact it does um qx d5 and black uh, plays knight f6 bishop takes d7 check knight takes d7 16 knight takes e5 knight b6 and then knight takes g6 check Black resigns, and this is precisely why you don't try and open the center when your opponent is or can castle and you aren't or can't. An important lesson for BRHS 2000 from an exciting game. Thank you both. Thank you to both players for playing in the Halloween Blitz Chess Extravaganza. And now let's move to our fourth game for the evening. Our next game is between BRHS2000 again, um, but this time he is playing Cloudy Cute. Let's take a look and see what happens. White started with d4. Black played d5 to c4. So we have Queen's Gambit. dx c4, Queen's Gambit accepted. Um, 3, Knight c3, Knight f6, e4, e6. And then uh, bishop takes c4. And this is why the queen's gambit isn't a real gambit after all. Because white only temporarily gives up their pawn. 5 c6. 6 knight f3. And uh, 6 knight b to d7. And this is where the players stop following in the footsteps of Jose Raul Capablanca and Francisco Prieto Azuar. That game continued let me go back one move show you a capablanca game that game continued with uh, bishop e7 and uh, kappa castled on move seven knight b to g7 knight to g5 h6 and then kappa's knight went back to h3 b5 Attacking the bishop. Bishop goes to d3. A6. Capablanca played e5 on move 11. Knight to d5. And then 12. Knight takes d5. Ex d5. Knight f4. And black needed to find a, uh, a, a way of getting... Um, their light squared bishop in the game and finding finding ideas for their knight so he elected to play knight f8 bishop e3 knight e6 capablanca played rook c1 getting rook in a semi-open file knight takes f4 bishop takes f4 bishop d7 capablanca played queen f3 unifying the rooks as usual, Capablanca makes it makes it look easy. His game, his uh, moves tend to be easy to guess up until a certain point, but hard to replicate the whole game. He had uh, what is known as a light touch, which meant um, he he didn't uh, play extremely complicated chess, but he played extremely accurately. And Black responded with Bishop G five, Rook F to E one. Rook to c8, rook to c3, getting ready to stack the rooks in the c file. Bishop e7, rook e to c1, there's that battery. Bishop to g5, um, g3. Bishop takes f4, queen takes f4, a5, rook to c5. And you'll see what uh, Capablanca is up to in a moment. Queen to g5. Queen takes g5. Hx g5. And then bishop takes b5. 
Rook goes to h6, bishop to a4, rook to b8, b3, king goes to e7 to get the rook, stack the rooks in the h-file is black's plan, obviously. But white plays rook takes a5, rook b to h8, king f1, rook takes h2, king e2. Rook goes back to h6. Kappa plays rook to the seventh rank. Another uh, example of the power in the rook in the seventh rank in Capablanca's games comes from uh, one of my favorites, Capablanca versus Tardikauer. So go ahead and look that game up if you get a chance. Um, rook goes to c8 to defend um, the pawn again. And then Capablanca plays rook c5. Rook goes to d8, and then uh, bishop takes c6. And black resigned. Capablanca always makes it look so simple. But let's get back to our game between BRHS2000 and Cloud EQ. Black has just played 6, knight b to d7. 7, castle. White's castle does complete control of the center and has a really easy position to play. Black plays bishop b4. Um, black, on the other hand, cloudy cute, on the other hand, needs to be accurate, get castled, figure out the plan for the bishop on c8, and eventually challenge white's advantage in space. So, not so simple. 8, queen to b3. Bishop takes c3. 9, bx c3. b5. This is actually a mistake, as bishop takes e6 is a thematic tactic in these kinds of positions. So I would prefer as black, let's go back one move. So for black's ninth move, I would prefer to play knight takes e4. And then after bishop a3, you could play knight b6. Then after bishop d3. You could play knight g5, knight takes g5, queen takes g5, and you're starting to get your pieces in the game. Um, but black played 9b5, and uh, Brian, BRHS2000, did not play bishop takes e6. He played 10 bishop d3. Let's back up one move and make sure that my thought um, is accurate and it looks pretty thematic to me I think if you play bishop takes e6 check f because see the knights on d7 is blocking the c8 bishop that's why we can we can do this here um, f takes e6 queen takes e6 of course king f8 bishop a3 check um, c5 can block it dx c5 Queen e7, try and take some heat off. Um, queen takes e7. King takes e7. Looks like uh, we took some heat off, but then white gets to play. Um, c6, discover, check, uh, threatening the knight. So you'll um, get, get your uh, sacrifice piece back with a uh, better position. So again, that uh, learn that thematic uh, sacrifice on e6. And maybe next time play it. So white played 10, bishop d3. Bishop to b7. Bishop a3. A good move. Excellent move, actually, because it keeps uh, black from castling. Black plays a6 for move 11. It's very difficult um, for even me to find uh, meaningful moves for black because they're stuck. They can't castle. And their bishop is imprisoned by their own pawns. Um, their knights really don't have anything to do. Um, so again, it's, it's difficult to find a, 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 meaningful, a meaningful plan. If they can exchange, um, they will uh, free up their position a little bit. And, uh, but, it, but it's easier said than done. Easier said than done. 
12 bishop b2 white undoes their last move in plan of keeping black in the center and i guess their new plan is hoping black will castle so they could play pawn e5 um kicking the knight and uh, starting starting an attack however switching back and forth between plans wastes time um, so I would prefer that white would have continued with their bishop on a3 um, with something like let's back up a move c4 c5 cx b5 ax b5 dx c5 castle and bishop takes uh, b5 looks pretty good here for me um i i would like to be white in this kind of position i mean you've got this uh you've got better piece placement um you've got uh, two pass pawns um what what's not to like about uh, about doing that as white um but white played 12 bishop b2 and black plays uh, 12 a5 I guess unable to free themselves in the center, they're going to try doing so on the flank. And BRHS 2000 plays uh, 13 a4, because um, obviously white is okay with opening the flank as well, since they've already got um, a rook and a queen in the uh, a and b file. So I, I think even opening the flank would uh, be advantageous to them especially since they already control the center. 13, bishop a6. I have to hand it to Cloudy Cute for a creative plan to unlock that light bishop. 14, ax b5, cx b5, bishop takes b5, bishop takes b5, queen takes b5, and knight takes e4. I'd still prefer to be white, but Black's position has been steadily improving, especially with the creation of the outside passed pawn on a5. 17, rook fe1, knight d6, 18, queen c6, knight f5, 19, d5. This push would be so much more effective if white plays bishop a3 first. Um, so that Black's king was trapped in the middle of the board. 19 castle. And rather than castle immediately, why not grab the initiative with uh, rook c8? So instead of 19 castle, let's back up a move. Why not try, I mean, white, white has advantages. Let's try and grab the initiative and see if we can uh, take over this game as Black. Um, so rook c8, attacking the queen. Maybe the queen goes to a6. Then you can castle. dx, e6. Knight c5, once again, attacking attacking the queen. Queen takes a5. fx, e6. And now both your rooks and queen are, are in action. Queen takes d8. Rook takes d8. And at least... In this position, we would force white to use good technique to win in the end game. Um, white still has the advantage. Um, they, they are up a pawn, and uh, their bishop will likely be better than either of black's knights, but it would, it would take uh, good technique. It would take uh, excellent technique, and you, you, you want to push your opponent to have to uh, demonstrate... Um, a mastery of the end game rather than just concede that uh, they have a small advantage and should win after 19 castle 20 dxe6 still very effective even though black is castled fxe6 rook a to d1 and how many times must i mention that the bishop belongs on a3. Think about how much better this would be if white's bishop was on a3. 
For instance, we could even take a moment to do that right now. So after 20 fx e6, um, you could take a moment to put the bishop back on e3 because you're attacking attacking the rook anyways. Although black could play rook c6 attacking, attacking your queen. But then you've got queen takes e6 check, rook f7, and then rook a to d1. And white's pieces would simply be dominating. But back to the actual game. So after 21, rook a to d1. And black played 21, rook f7. A key mistake by Cloudy Cube. Rather than defend the pin knight and wait for white's knight to join the attacking party, better would to strongly suggest a trade. For example, let's go back one move. I like 21, queen to b6. Followed by queen takes e6, check. Followed by queen takes e6. Followed by rook takes e6. And white is still up a pawn, but can't really make use of it because it's on the king side. However, both sides have passed pawns that are, that are dangerous and on the queen side. And the resulting endgame would be a good test of skill. So after 21, rook f7, 22, knight g5. And of course, uh, 22, knight e5 also works well. Um, knight takes e5, rook takes d8, check. Um, rook takes d8. And as long as uh, BRHS2000 wouldn't play uh, rook takes knight here, um, you'd, be, you'd be just fine. Um, you, you would want to play uh, queen takes e6 because if you if you play rook takes the free knight it's not so free it's not so free um, so interesting stuff following 2295 but let's get back to the actual game after 22 knight g5 rook e7 and you know, uh, 22, queen takes g5, queen takes a8, knight f8, and then uh, queen takes a5. Leaves black with uh, better chances, I think, than uh, 22, rook e7. But black played 22, rook e7, so let's return to that. After 22, rook e7... White plays 23, knight takes e6. Dare I say again that bishop a3 first is better? I kind of sound like a broken record on repeat, but um, look at this bishop. It just, it wants to be useful, Brian. Let your bishop be useful. Black plays... 23 queen b6 and that is a big mistake because nothing's defending the rook on a8 um, black should have played queen to e8 saving the queen and still defending the rook but queen takes a8 24 queen takes a8 check king f7 knight g5 check king g6 rook takes e7 knight takes e7 27 queen e4 Knight f5, g4, queen takes b2, queen takes f5 check, king h6, and a nice checkmate. Knight f7 mate. Another very instructive game. I think both sides hopefully learned a lot. Um, and our viewers at home, uh, you learned how to diffuse, uh, a common way of diffusing a game, but you got to see a Capablanca game, and I love to show a Capablanca game anytime I get a chance. And we got to see a position which favored white, um, but not by much. But white's position was much easier to play than black's position was, because black's um, pieces were cramped. Um, and so we, we got to see a nice uh, dynamic Whereas you can sometimes feed a chess position into a computer for analysis, and it might show you that, hey, the, the position's uh, fairly even, 
but in practical applications, um, it's it's a lot different because in this case, white had a much easier game to play. However, um, white uh, that whole time having the bishop on b2 um, really really got on my nerves a little bit because that bishop wanted to participate. So um, I think we also learned a, uh, a good lesson there. Don't, don't forget about a piece, um, especially, especially a piece that can so easily be made more, more valuable. But all in all, a, uh, a nice game by both players. Um, thank you very much, BRHS2000 and Cloudy Cute, for playing in the Halloween Blitz chess extravaganza 2020 again if you want to uh, see a lot of these games as they occurred live go ahead and uh, find our uh, video archive of the live stream for the halloween blitz chess extravaganza let's move on to game five which will be our final game of the evening game five for this episode of analyze that was played between Limelight 2727 and Royal Knight 101, two of the stronger players in our Daily Chess Musings Chess Club. Uh, Royal Knight 101's beaten me a couple times in Blitz games already this year, and Limelight 2727 has, in fact, already obtained the National Master title and also went undefeated in our um, Halloween Blitz Chess Extravaganza across three tournaments. So extremely impressive performance by Limelight 2727. Um, the game we're going to look at now came in the second of the three Halloween Blitz Chess Extravaganzas and was played in uh, round three between these two juggernauts. Let's see what happens. Limelight 27, 27 plays d4, and Royal Knight 101, d5, c4, knight f6. A rare example of the martial defense in the Queen's Gambit decline seen in the wild. You don't often see the martial defense because it is considered to be a, a substandard option for black, but it certainly can create some fun play, as we'll see in this game. White plays three, knight c3. If you want to be more provocative as white in the uh, martial defense of the Queen's Gambit, then I suggest using Alexander Kotov versus Vyacheslav Ragozin, 1956, as a guide. In that game, white played CX d5, knight takes d5, and then white gets to play e4 getting both pawns in the center with tempo black's knight's got to move to f6 you could play e5 here but um in uh, kotov versus Rigozin, uh, kotov played knight c3 and then black played e5 fun stuff knight f3 ex d4 queen takes d4 queen takes d4 knight takes d4 bishop b4 f3 c6 bishop g5 kodov keeps developing his pieces knight b to d7 and castle queen side white maintains a nice edge and eventually wins after uh, 39 moves again that is from uh, kotov versus rogozin 1956 if you want to check that out but let's get back to our actual game, Limelight 2727 versus Royal Knight 101. And Ro uh, Limelight 2727 had just played three, Knight C3. Royal Knight 101 plays E6, CX D5, Knight takes D5, 5E4, Knight takes C3, BX C3, and Pawn to C5. I like black immediately challenging white center here, and apparently so does Grandmaster Dominguez Perez, who played it three times in St. Louis in 2019. Once again, 
Mom Diarov once against Ding Loren, and once against even Magnus Carlsen. This is a very interesting line at all levels of chess. White plays seven knight f3. Um, the obvious developmental choice to preserve the pawn center. Cx d4, Cx d4, bishop b4 check, bishop d2, bishop takes d2 check, queen takes d2, and 10 castle is what black played. And this is still well-traveled in opening theory, so we'll just continue on. 11, bishop c4. Black plays 11, b6. Knight d7 is considered the uh, main line. But royal knight's move is an interesting alternative. 12, castle. And then 12, bishop a6. I really like royal knight 101's play here. This is a smart placement of the bishop, and uh, it brings to memory uh, a game I saw between David Bronstein and Yuri Anakiv from 1983. David Bronstein had a very long chess career um, and was a very strong grandmaster who gave us a lot of fresh ideas in chess. So definitely worth checking out uh, some games by David Bronstein when you get the chance. 13, bishop takes a6, and oddly enough, I have no record of the seemingly obvious trade being played before. I can't believe that. Um, as, as I said, this is well-traveled in opening theory, but the obvious trade here um, has not been used in recorded chess history that I'm aware of. 13, knight takes a6, 14, rook f to c1, uh, rook c8, 15, queen d3, good stuff. Knight b4, um, also good stuff. Moving the knight off the rim and attacking the queen. Queen b3, queen e7, unifying rooks. Everything played so far makes sense. And we have a very equal but imbalanced position that should maintain interest for us very easily. Um, 17, a3, knight c6. Queen b5, queen to b7, 19 h3. Doesn't really hurt white, but doesn't really help either. Perhaps white felt a little uneasy about pushing d5 here, but it seems like the natural choice. For instance, had white played 19 d5, then you have um, ex d5, ex d5. And black is left with a tricky decision as to where to move his knight to. Knight b8 actually looks best. And then knight d4. So white forced black's knight back and improved their knight. Um, seems like a good variation to me. So definitely an improvement over 19h3. But let's go back to the game after 19h3. Black chooses to advance his two-on-one advantage with initiative. Queen goes to b2, knight e7, 21, queen e2. Rook takes c1, check. Rook takes c1. Rook c8 is black's 22nd move. And royal knight 101 is trying to trade pieces and then create an outside pass pawn with that two-on-one advantage. 23, rook d1 b5. Things are very even, but I think I would prefer to be black here, as his plan it seems simple and dangerous for white. Just scooting these guys forward, getting that pass pawn. 24, queen e3. h6. I guess uh, royal knight sees no point in risking um, a back rank mate if he has to uh, if he has to use his rook to support um, his, his pawn promotion. 25 h4. White senses black's intention and with this risky advance tries to uh, muddy up the waters a little bit. Perhaps better and a more natural way to create uh, counterplay would have been 25 knight e5 obviously moving your knight closer to your opponent's king 
and black cannot uh, easily move it. It's not officially on an outpost, but black cannot easily move it without creating some kind of weakness around its king. Um, black could play queen c7, but then white could play queen f3, threatening f7. Black could play f6 again, creating weakness around his king. And then knight g4, um, creating some nice, some nice counterplay. Black has this two-on-one um, advantage on the uh, uh, queen side to create a uh, deep outside pass pawn, but white is definitely um, making black's king feel uneasy and setting up uh, some potential tactics with the pawns being advanced, with the castled pawns being advanced in this fashion and the knight and queen hanging out over there. But back to our main game. After 25 h4, black plays 25 queen c7, 26 d5, and I still think knight e5 looks best. Is black either has to live with the knight being there or create create targets for uh, for white as we just looked at in the last variation. 26 ex d5. 27 ex d5, 27 knight f5, 27 uh, queen d6 would have placed the queen on a more influential square as well as stopping the pawn from moving forward. So I think I prefer the uh, queen d6 move there. 28 queen d3. And 28 knight d6 with the d pawn blocked. And a very secure position for black. Um, this is starting to look rather drosh. But let's see what happens. 29 knight d4. 29 queen c4. 30 knight c6. No need to drop the h pawn here for white. I think probably better. Let's go back for one second. Um... I think better would be just plain queen takes c4, rook takes c4, then rook d3. And then black can play this clever rook a4 move, threatening both the knight and the uh, pawn, and then uh, uh, forcing white's rook to stay, stay put for now. White can play uh, 32 g3, and uh, really, um, this should end up, uh, should end up being a draw. However, let's go back to the game after 30 knight c6. So after 30 and c6, black plays king h8, but instead of stepping out of the fork right away, black actually could have played 30 q takes h4 which is backward defending the uh, e7 square from the fork white could add pressure with 31 rook e1 and then uh, now black could step out of the way maybe uh, queen d2 queen c4 and black would have been safely up the pawn for the time being so white uh, Gave away their h-pawn for not the best of reasons, and black didn't take it for not the best of reasons. Um, so a little bit of uh, strangeness there, but still very high-level game these two, are, these two are engaged in. Let's get back to our actual game. After 30, king h8. 31, queen takes c4, bx c4. 32, king f1, g5. Uh, I don't know about that. Um, playing g6 is better as it doesn't give white the potential for the getting the uh, rook to h1 and also uh, giving the fact that their pawn, you spent a tempi moving the pawn to h4 and now you're giving it purpose for, for being there. So I think uh, g6 would have been a uh, be better choice for uh, black. 
hxg5, 33 hxg5, hxg5, 34 king e2, king g7, king e3. The king must be active in the endgame. Clearly, it has its eyes on d4 and causing some problems. King f6, black knows. Royal knight 101 knows that the king should be active in the endgame. But we, we have to remember, this is a blitz game. But he fails to notice that white's king is going to get to the center first and create problems. So instead of doing that, um, if white's going to move his king to the center and create threats, I say we use our rook to get to the seventh rank and create threats. For example, let's step back one moment. Um, instead of king f6, we could have, uh, royal knight 101 could have played rook e8, check, king d4. And then rook to e2. White's king is much better than black's, but black's rook is much better than white's. Let's get back to the actual game. After, so after 35, king f6, king uh, 36, king d4, of course, knight to b5. And now under time pressure and in the face of white's threats, black's position begins to fall apart. 37, king takes c4. 37, knight takes a3 check. Uh, 38, king c5. Knight b5, 39, d6, pass pawns must be pushed. Knight takes d6. I see the danger in the pass pawn, but something worth looking at um, would be alternatively playing 39, knight to a7, which case uh, d7, of course. Rook takes c6 is check, so that pawn's not promoting on this move. King can go to b4, but then you got rook b6 check. King could go to c3, but then you got rook c6 check. King could go to b3, but so on and so forth. It's a possible drawing line. Um, clearly, I mean, there's potential after rook to b6 of white moving into the a file. Um, but this gives, this gives black chances to reorganize things as well. Um, so it, it, it seems like a possible drawing line rather than the definitely losing line. And so uh, um, Black should have played 39 knight to a7, but I totally understand Royal Knight 101. You've played an extremely good chess. This is a blitz game and you were already under time pressure when you played 39, knight takes d6 to remove the uh, threat of the promotion. So after 39, knight takes d6, 40, rook takes d6, check, king f5, 41, king d5, king g4, 42, knight to e5, king h4, and then uh, 43 is the uh, pretty checkmate. Um, by white, very high level game, very high level game um, between Limelight 2727 and Royal Knight 101. Certainly what I would expect from these two talented young chess players who have very bright futures in chess. Um, I especially enjoyed Royal Knight's uh, choice of the Rare and somewhat unsound martial defense to the uh, Queen's Gambit declined. Um, and I also really enjoyed all of the good tactical sense both players demonstrated, um, spotting most of each other's uh, tactical shots during the uh, whole game. Um, the game was, was very, very interesting and uh, um, certainly an opportunity for uh, us to learn a lot. And I am very glad that I got the chance to uh, see this game. So thank you very much, Limelight2727 and Royal Knight 101 for playing in the Halloween Blitz Chess Extravaganza 2020. 
For those of you who enjoyed this episode of Analyze That, be sure to like the uh, episode and subscribe to the Daily Chess Musings channel on YouTube. Also, remember, all these games were played during the Halloween Blitz Chess Extravaganza. The Daily Chess Musings Club has a bunch of fun events um, like these scheduled every month. So you should join the Daily Chess Musings Club. Easy to do. You just go to dailychessmusings.com and join our club. And then you go to uh, chess.com and join our club on chess.com. And you will have access to all of these fun and free events. Plus, you can also then send your games to analyze that at gmail.com to have your games featured on this show. Remember that uh, all of the games in, from today's episode were from the Halloween Blitz Chess Extravaganza that you can see on the same YouTube channel. You can watch the whole episode where I live stream that tournament. It was a lot of fun. Once again, I have been your host, Chris Torres, and this has been Analyze That. Have a good week. Mm -hmm.